everyone. Um, my name is Jenny Geisbauer. I'm the executive director of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Library Foundation. And we are honored to have one of the Carolina's greatest authors, um, Lee Smith, join us today to talk about her new book, Silver Alert, which um, I loved going to your website to see Dolly Parton's quote that said, this book is, it's very different and it's very special and it's very good. Um, so if Dolly says that, then we all, we all will follow that. Um, let me tell everyone a little bit about, um, so this is our second final draft of our season. Our next two will be on June 19th and July 17th in person at Town Brewing. So we look forward um, to having everyone there. Um, you know, we got a lot going on right now as um, we are in the middle of our Common Spark campaign um, to build a new main library, as well as uh, provide programming technology for our library system. And so there's different ways to get engaged with us over the next couple of years. Um, one, if you would like to host a whistle stop, which are intimate gatherings at your home or at a brewery or a library, to allow the Library Foundation to come and tell your friends and family members and contacts um, more about our library system and what is going on, as well as seeing images of the new main library. We also have something called Around the World in 21 Branches. It's a tour for the next two years around our library system that will be at sat uh, once a month um, on a Saturday, we'll be there and it's a festival type environment for three hours for families and adults. And we would love to have you join us. Um, and then last, if you have a big birthday coming up or anniversary and don't want gifts anymore and want to support the Library Foundation, please let us know. We, we'd be glad to be a recipient of that. Um, and I just want to give a big shout out to our friends at Sharon Towers. Lee, we have a big group of folks joining us um, from Sharon Towers. So thank you for being with us. Um, and then last, before I introduce our speakers, if you um, have a question, please put it in the Q&A box. And Selena will um, help facilitate that with um, Lee Smith. Okay, so on to our two speakers and then Selena and Lee will take over. Selena Giovanelli has served on the Library Foundation Board for the last three years. Um, she is a graduate from App State, Appalachian State University. I'm sure you really just don't like when people say App State. Um, and then she got her Juris Doctorate at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where she did practice law for several years, many years at several different firms. Um, and is now serving as a civic leader on several boards. Um, she is one of our incoming chairs. She grew up in Lincolnton and now lives in Charlotte with her husband, Rick, and their son, Matthew, and their dog, Scout, who, has, um, who was named for the narrator of To Kill a Mockingbird. Oh, wow. She is a voracious <laughs> reader uh, who truly understands the significance of libraries as primary components of community development. So thank you, Selena, for being with us. And then last but not least, let me tell you a little bit about our author, Lee Smith. She began writing stories at, at the age of nine and selling them for a nickel a piece. I remember hearing this, um, uh, Lee, when you spoke at Levine Museum several years ago. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. And I heard that story and I was like, nickel a piece. That is, that is smart. <laughs> Then she has written 17 works of fiction, including Fair and Tender Ladies, Oral History, Guest on Earth, Dime Store, and most recently, Silver Alert. She has received many awards, including the North Carolina Award for Literature and an Academy Award in Fiction from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Her novel, The Last Girls, was a New York Times bestselling off seller, as well as winner of the Southern Book Critics Circle Award. So thank you both for joining us and thank I will let you take over. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Lee, for being here. I'm so excited to talk to you today and especially to talk about the book. But before we get to the new book, um, I just wanted to ask you some questions about your start and your, your growing up experience. And so my first one is kind of two parts. One, 
why did you decide to become a writer? And I know that in other interviews, you commented often on how growing up in this small town in Virginia really impacted your career going forward. Um, so I'd like for you to talk about why you became a writer and then how your hometown impacted you in that career. Okay, all right. Well, um, I, I think it has a whole lot to do with your parents and where you live when you're young, you know? And um, I was born to older parents who had been told they could never have a child. And so I was just an astonishment, I think. And they were, you know, probably if I had said I wanted to be an axe murderer, they would have gone out and bought me an axe, you know? <laughs> so, but as it was, um, they were, and I was born into a family, an Appalachian family of big talkers, big storytellers and so on. That's the extended family, which was huge. It was in our house, it was only me and my mom and my daddy, but we had a huge family that was all over town and that we saw a lot of. So I was growing up in a very verbal culture. They were all in politics. They were all yellow dog Democrats, which means you vote for yellow dog instead of Republican. And they were all storytellers. And so I was, um, because I was an only child, I was very much in the presence of the grownups, actually, on all those evenings on my grandmother's porch when they were all, you know, telling these stories and drinking a little and carrying it on. And I so often uh, went to sleep. I mean, you know, I never, they never put me to bed. I could just stay up as long as I did. And so I often went to sleep, you know, in the arms of somebody that loved me whether it was my own parents or my uncle Dick or whoever, you know, it might have been. And therefore, I associate stories always, I think, with the voice, it's oral stories. And I associate them with love. And I just associate them with something I'm real comfortable with. And so I just grew up on this kind of stories. And even today, when I'm writing, um, it's like I hear the story in my head and it's a voice. You know, and I'm writing longhand still on yellow pads because that's the way it comes to me. And it it's all has to do with the very personal nature of storytelling. I mean, even with my most recent book, Silver Lark. So um, that's how I that's how I started. And I got a lot of, um, you know, a lot a great love of language. And then um, my daddy and I loved writing and I. I had a little, I used to go down and stay and, and made myself a little lean-to on the riverbank behind their house. And then I, and I would go down there and write little stories. And then my daddy built me an actual, uh, an actual little house down there. You know, like a, it was like a big dog house. So it was, you know, it wasn't lovely, but that was my writing house. And as a child, I always had a writing house on the riverbank. And a host of imaginary friends that lived down there with me, too. And the river used to flood, which it still does. But um, every time it would flood, I, Dad would get me a new writing house. And sometimes it was just a big packing crate that something had been sent to the dime store in. He owned a dime store. Or, some, or it was a little shed that was a prefab shed or something. But I always had my writing house down on the river bank. And I was always around... Uh, storytellers as well as good teachers later on who gave me books but so this is how it all started out I think very much uh spoken very much told stories I love that I grew up in a small town um Lincolnton which is probably 40 oh, yeah. minutes from here yeah. and um I, we, my family also had that great history of storytelling. Unfortunately, I'm not a writer. I didn't do with it what you did. Um, but I really love that. Um, you have written one memoir called Dime Store, which is sort of yeah. the story of your upbringing. Um, otherwise, you mostly write fiction. And so my question is, why fiction? Um, I don't, I enjoy it so much. You know, when I'm writing nonfiction, I mean, you know, you're supposed to be telling the truth. And that's kind of, that can get kind of boring to me. <laughs> I don't know. I like to make things up. I just like to make things up. What can I say? And um, the first stories I always wrote, I just, you know, I had a hard time. And I was a newspaper reporter in my younger days, actually in Alabama, 
and so on. And I just had the hardest time sticking to the facts. I mean, the hardest time. And I, but I got some great material for fiction from those days in Alabama too on the newspaper. But I just early on realized that I re I'm a person who likes to make things up. And I'm interested in the real stuff. I write nonfiction too, you know, but I really like to make things up. That's what I got to say. So when you were writing. Because real life does not always suit what you want to, you know, the points you want to write. So Absolutely. So when you were writing your memoir, did that just come easier than like writing a newspaper article because you were just kind of writing it from the heart and from your own memory and experiences? Would that Was that an easier kind of nonfiction to write? No, it was, no, it's, it was much harder because I was determined to, to absolutely, you know, I love to read people's memoirs, other people's memoirs myself, and I was determined to absolutely tell the truth and to figure out what things were important to put in, important to tell, and it was just hard to make those decisions. With fiction, you know, you just kind of, you can do what you want, but I really wanted to tell the truth, and I really wanted to be uh, accurate and true to the people I loved. And I learned a whole lot, though. I would recommend to anybody to write, you know, to do some of this kind of memoir writing, because as you do it, you just realize things about your own life that you hadn't. I mean, it was a real learning experience for me and made me realize the importance of a whole lot of things that I hadn't thought much about and made me and it makes you remember that's the great thing when you get to be my age you know you're in danger of forgetting a whole lot of things and you won't ever forget them because there they are I mean it's a great thing for all of us to do it really is did, so you, I find, it. did you find in writing that that you would there was something that you if you could have looked back on your younger self like your 15 or 16 year old or 20 year old self and said wow do this differently or is there anything oh. that kind of really resonated with you about how you wish you could go back and tell that younger person something that you now know that may have oh yeah absolutely many things many things and I don't think I even but that's also that's part of the value for us the, the writer you know to, to to do our own lives you know to write to write it down because it makes us see in a different you know you, it's like you've externalized in a well, you've, you've got it on, you know, it's on the page and you can look at it and say, why did she do that? But it was, why did you do, why did I do that, you know, at the time and so on. And it really is a great way toward self-understanding and also just looking at certain things differently. I mean, to, to put, to get it on the page gives us a perspective mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. very helpful and enjoyable it really is and once you start remembering you know then you remember more and more and I would take a whole lot of notes before I wrote any section and it just as I wrote things down you know more and more things come so if you put yourself in the position of having memories you will you'll have them and lots of stuff will come back and then I'm calling my cousins <laughs> you know, that I hadn't even spoken to for who knows how long. And then they're telling me all this stuff. And then I had a family reunion right in the middle because I just decided to after right in the middle of writing this book. And it was so much fun. So it just puts us in touch with our earlier selves. And uh, it's very, very enjoyable, even though some parts might be painful. It's interesting. Very interesting. Well, I'm sure lots of people who are listening or um, thinking about, you know, wow, what's it, what must it be like to be a writer? And so one of the questions that we always, you know, I think authors are always asked is what's your writing process? Like, how do you, you talked about working on, you know, a longhand on a yellow legal pad, but when you're thinking of a new book, irrespective of your memoir, which of course was probably a little bit different, but if you're working on a piece of fiction, yeah. how do you come up with, you know, what's your writing process? How do you start and how does it turn into this great book at the end? Well, you know, I think each each book comes with its own demands and its own needs. And those can be so very, very different. Um, the book I just finished, Silver Alert, was something that was, um, you know, entirely made up out of my head. You know, I mean, it started with an actual incident which I'll tell you later on. But then from there on, the characters were completely made up and so on and so on. On the other hand, uh, a book like 
Guests on Earth, which tells the story of Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald's last years, basically, and particularly of Zelda's life in the mental hospital and where she died in the in the horrible fire, you know, of 1947. And so there you have a whole lot of research and you have a whole lot of uh, other kinds of work to do. Um, I wrote a book on Agate Hill, which is a Civil War novel set starting in my own house. I mean, set in Hillsboro, North Carolina, and it was all research. So each book comes with its own demands and its own, own kind of place to start. With some of those, you have to amass a whole lot of material, or I find that I do. Have I got enough for a book? Do I really know enough about Zelda? No, I'm going to go to Baltimore and get all the letters. No, I'm going to go here and I'm going to do that. I'm going to get all the papers from the hospital, which I was able to do. It was great. But, you know, it's uh, each book comes with its own demands and each book is a journey for the writer. You know, it, it's a it's a terrific it's a great privilege and pleasure to do this work, I would have to say. Um, well, you, of course, are um, one of the most lauded living Southern writers. And why do you think and you've touched on this a little bit, but why do you think, especially in the South, that the storytelling writing tradition is so important? Um, I'm not sure. I, I think it's so important just because we have, have one, you know, and I think we really do. And we have all, you know, we have all grown up with it. And those of us who have been reading all our lives have been reading a lot of these Southern writers and so on. And it just seems that we do have this, we do have something called Southern literature. You don't have Midwestern literature, you know. I mean, you don't have Maine literature. Another place I spend a lot of time, you could, but you don't. And so um, I think it's, it, it's, it's this tradition of story you know, whether, whether we're speaking, you know, African-American, whether we're speaking uh, any, you know, any group, we have this tradition of talking and we have this tradition of story and it has moved into our, you know, moved into our literature. And do you um, think that's- we're very lucky to have it. Do you think that's why Southern writers are so unique, like that because they are just- most of Southern writers have just lived these experience and they've lived with, you know, the storytelling tradition. Does that what makes, like when we talk about Southern literature, is that what makes Southern yeah. writers different? Um, I don't know. I think it's what makes them right. Mm -hmm. Because we, we think in terms of stories, when we have conversations with each other, it's in terms of stories. People are always just telling each other little stories and we talk, we talk a lot. And we're talkative and we're telling, talking to each other. As I said, I spend, um, I spend some summers now in Maine and they don't talk. <laughs> I mean, you know, you can run into somebody. I mean, they just don't talk like we do. You know, you, you can be in some little Maine town and you'll say, well, where's the post office? And they'll say, two blocks turn left. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Or if you're in some Southern town and you're walking along, you say, where's the post office? They say, well, it used to be right over there, but then we had this fire and such and such and such and such. But you can go that way and don't forget to stop it. You know, and it, they talk. We talk a lot more. And I think that has not changed. You know, and it's it's uh, a kind of a, a way of uh, facing the world of communicating and so on. And so uh, I think we all we grew up with that. Now, of course, we do have now cities like Charlotte, though, that are full of people from all over the place, many different kinds of people from many different kinds of groups. And so things are changing. This is more the small town old style South, I think I'm talking about, but it still obtains in many, many small towns because we've got them. We've still got them. Absolutely. Um, how do you think your writing has changed over time? So let's say, you know, for each book, do you have like some current event or something that just happens to be on your mind? Um, do you feel like sort of your themes have remained constant over the course of writing or is it just dependent on like whatever background you choose that brings up whatever issues or do you feel different urgencies of message with each book or it just whatever hits you? Well, with me, it's been uh, it's been a journey. I think it's been a wonderful kind of a journey. And I think with almost all of us, um, 
one of the reasons we start writing at all is because we feel like somehow out of the uh, the the trauma and longings and whatever of our youth, you know, we have certain things that we care deeply about. We have certain things that we've been through. We have certain things to say, you know, and so I think we all uh, start off from a very personal, I mean, most of us who are writing fiction or poetry, you know, uh, creative, creative writing, as they say, and I think we start off very, from a very personal kind of the stance of, as I said, I was a, I was an only child, a very weird and imaginative little child uh, who was uh, always writing, you know, writing in my writing house down by the riverbank. And so it shouldn't be a surprise that my first novel, which I began writing uh, as a project when I was a senior at Highlands College, Women's College in Virginia, in Roanoke, Virginia, turned into my first novel. And it's about a similar child you know, who is, uh, and, but of course you, to write fiction, you got to have conflict. That's the one absolute necessary thing for good fiction. And I didn't have maybe that much conflict. So in my first novel, I, uh, it was a child much like I, much like I was, you know, with her place, with her house on the riverbank, with her, you know, pet salamanders and all this kind of stuff, but she had to have, she had to have more crisis or she wasn't going to have a, I wasn't going to have a novel. And so in the novel, the parents are breaking up, you know, the, the parent, the, the marriage is coming apart. The parents are breaking up and she, she begins to live even more in the world of her imagination, which is becoming a much more dangerous place. And so it's fiction finally, because you have to up the ante. A lot Thank of the time, but yeah. that child and that child and all those little animals around the riverbank and all that, that was real, but you all, but you have, if you don't have conflict, you're not going to have fiction. Right. So, right. Yeah. That's a great segue into my next question. And so I'm going to hold up a copy of the book, which all of our listeners will receive. Right. And it's, first of all, a beautiful cover. I love it. Bright. I, love the cover too. I just love it. Yeah, I do. Um, and I loved the book. I really, really Thank enjoyed you. reading it. So Thank my you. question, as we were talking about, like, what inspired you to write your first book? What inspired you to write this? Yes. Book? Uh, well, you know what? My fiction, I, although I'm really a fiction writer, mostly. I've done the one, you know, one book of, you know, book of, of autobiographical essays. But, but uh, and they all come from life in some way. You know, they come out of my own real life. And consequently, Silver Alert absolutely did. So this is a great story. Um, my husband and I have gone to Key West many times. Um, I've often taught down there at the Key West Literary Seminars and so on in January. And about five years ago, we were driving back from Key West. And we like to drive. We like driving trips. And we particularly love Route 1, <laughs> which goes from Miami to Key West. And it's like you're driving through the sky. You know, I mean, those huge bridge after bridge after bridge. It's just fabulous, you know, through the Keys. So anyway, we were driving home from Key West and um, all of a sudden, right across the highway ahead of us, this big thing came, you know, in lights came up and it said silver alert. And then it had the make and model of a car. And then it had called this number. And we had never seen this before. So we said, well, what is this? And we just, we didn't know. But then about 15, 20 miles later, it came up again, silver alert. And this time we were paying more attention. And Hal said, well, you know, you know what an amber alert is. That's when a child. Helping me out here, thank goodness. She's much. No worry. So we were just listening to you talk about the silver alert, and then you saw it the second time. We saw it the second time, and it said, you know, this big electronic silver alert sign over the highway. And my husband said, "Well, you know, amber alert. That's when a child goes missing." And he said, "But here we are in Florida. Florida's full of geezers, right? Such as ourselves, you know, full of older people. It must mean when a, some older person has gotten hold of their car and gone off in the car, and they were, and they're looking for them. That's what it is. And we got fascinated, so we began sort of making up a scenario. You know how you do when you're driving, you get bored, so you start making up a 
stuff in your head. And we had imagined that it's an old guy and uh, he's found the keys to his car. They've taken the car away from him and he's found the keys to the car and uh, in an old golf shoe or something. And he's gotten in his car is a Porsche Carrera. And so he's gotten in the car and he's taken off. And by the third time we saw this come across the highway, we had added a passenger and we said, and he's taken the Manny Petty girl from assisted living with him. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. that, was their, that was their story. And basically that is the plot of Silver Alert. And of course, my then my task as a writer was to, who are these people? You know, figure out who is the old man? What was his life like? When you write, write something, you know, you got to know what their whole lives, the care for the characters, how, what was his whole life like up until this point when he did this? Who is he? And who is the girl? Mm -hmm. And why is she willing to get in the car with him? And it turns out she has a whole history of her own and a reason to get out of town too. But so uh, anyway, so it was just, it was great fun to write it. And then of course we had to um, drive it a few more times to get all the details, which are all real. You know, everything in there is, is, is real and not made up. And uh, the, the car being a Porsche Carrera didn't hurt either because yes, that, right. that said, okay, it's gonna be a very interesting owner of, of one sort or another. So anyway, it was just lots of fun, lots of fun to do. And I just had to do a lot of work to fill in the story on who the characters were and what their backstory was and what was going to happen, you know, but that's where it came from. Right. So speaking of the characters, and I don't want to give away too much about the book because I know everyone wants to read it. Um, but I, I, I know that one of your sort of more consistent themes is especially dealing with girls or women coming of age. And I feel like in this yeah. book, even with Herb, like is about like a person feeling trapped in their circumstances or a person who doesn't have the power to change whatever circumstance they're in. And yes. so I want you to talk about that a, with a, a little bit with respect to this book and how that might be a part of your thought in developing these characters. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's very much, uh, when they get it, when they get in the, the car and take off, they're both really essentially trying to get out of circumstances that they don't want to be in and then things that happen to us in life with. And so I'm very much writing about aging in a way. And I'm that age, you know, and so about, you know, how our family gets together and says, OK, you're going in the home now. There's an intervention and they're telling Herb, old Herbert Atlas, who was just a crusty, terrible you know, wonderfully terrible guy. And uh, he is uh, not happy to be told anything. He's been the boss of the phone life. And so the certain, so I'm writing about aging, lots of things that I've been thinking about, you know, and know people that are, that are dealing with. And so the family's had an intervention. They're sending Herb to the home where his wife already is because she has Alzheimer's. And so, and he's in a you know so he that's his situation the girl the Manny Petty girl who comes to who has come to help his wife you know while he had her at you know at the house and was trying to take care of her um she has her own agenda she has her own reasons for uh being happy to get in that car you know and take off and she has her, her own issues that she is dealing with and she is although she's wonderfully cheerful and funny and a great singer and so on she's had a pretty dark past and a very difficult girlhood and dealt with some some pretty bad issues and some things that I wanted to write about you know so as they make the trip these things from the past you know keep are, are coming back and so on and we know who they are and we know you know each one of them what their agenda was and and when where they are and so and I just fell in love with them both of them I have to say so. um I know that lately a lot of things I've read and I feel like this was the case in Silver Alert too lot one of the big themes recently has been like a, around memory and so the fact that you have an, a character who is yeah. going through Alzheimer's and then you have characters who are remembering or, or revealing to us things that happened in their past. Was that yeah. an intentional, like, I want to talk about memory or I want this novel to reflect some thoughts I'm having about memory and how it affects Well, us? I think in a certain, I mean, in a certain way, all these, char these characters are certainly not me, 
you know, but they are, their concerns are some, some things that I've really been thinking about. I'm almost 80, you know, and uh, there's, and everybody I know that's my contemporaries dealing with the issues of aging one way or another. And so, you know, as I say, writing fiction is a great way to deal with anything, you know, and so that's Harv. I love Harv and he is not, he is not happy with, you know, being put in the home and so on. And these are, these are very strong issues. And then the girl too, uh, Dee Dee, and I love Dee Dee so much. And Dee Dee's dealing, Dee Dee's had a really bad past and she has, is dealing with some issues that I have been very interested in. And I don't, I don't think it ruins the book for the readers, I hope, uh, to talk about it, but this, uh, you know, sex trafficking and so on. She has been really mistreated and misused as a child and then got into real trouble, you know, was in, is in, goes to jail, is in prison, and then was in a wonderful place, a sort of a rehab type community, which is something I first found out some years back when I was doing um, benefits, a benefit in Nashville, along with my friends, Jill McCorkle and Marshall Chapman and um, Matrisa Berg. And we were doing the show named Good Old Girls that we used to do. And it was to benefit um, Thistle Farms. And I didn't know what that was at the time. That's the first time I encountered that a type of a place, which is essentially rehab for women who have been on the street or who have gone through these kinds of troubles. And you know where you learn how to make a living. You learn how to do all kinds of things that you never got to learn at all. You learn. You go to school. You do all this. You know, and that's what Thistle Farms is, and it still is. And there are many other places like that. And then I've worked somewhat in Maine, at you know doing writing workshops at a similar spot there. And so I just have gotten. I mean, I think that's a big issue of our times. And uh, you know, so I wanted to have that in the book too, and to, to kind of write about, about that. And uh, so Dee Dee is coming out of a, of a difficult, difficult situation. And she also never had an education. I mean, literacy is, a, is an issue here too. She never got an education because people keep taking her out of school and, you know, and so uh, she's learning words. Here she gets herself with a, a book and she's word. She's always learning these new words. And so it's growth and it's that kind of thing. I just love Dee Dee. So anyway, these are some issues that I've just been that I've been thinking about. I loved both the characters too for, for oh, very you. different reasons. But one thing that they I felt like similarly, they both had this joie de vivre about life. Like even they though they were in this circumstance, they still had their well, you know, I can appreciate this or I'm going to do this. Or, oh, I'm so glad you got that because they do. They enjoy the moment. You know, it's just, these are stolen moments in, in tough lives, you know, and there they are in this Porsche driving along and having, you know, having dinner in a restaurant and stuff like that, you know, it's great. I loved that. I thought that was so inspiring, you know, because sometimes like things can, can feel bad for people, but just being able to have that little bit of positivity. Yeah. Um, yeah. like a real, well, a real you know, somebody said too, one thing, there's a quote that I just love. Uh, somebody once said, there are only two plots in literature. One plot is uh, somebody takes a trip. Mm -hmm. And that's this, you know, it's the best, the oldest, you know, and another, the second plot is a stranger comes to town, <laughs> which is also good. But you know, this is the, this is the classic. This is the, from the Canterbury Tales on somebody takes a trip and what's dealt the, the business of the trip and then what does it mean what does it mean to the people who took it and so you know that's a good place just do that you got a million novels you know you got a million novels to write if you think from that from that standpoint I'm going to ask you one more question and then we're going to go to some questions from our listeners okay but my last question for you about the book is um I loved um, in addition to the characters, I loved the description of the setting. I loved how much you talked about Susan's garden. And I really felt like that was representative of sort of a safe place, a place that could be contemplative, a place that people could go hide from the rest of their family. Um, and so I know- before, <laughs> We need to do that sometimes, right? You do, you <laughs> absolutely do. Um, I feel like one of the things that you've kind of talked about or used kind of in your books consistently is sort of this environmental conservation or what are we doing with yeah. our land? So what yeah. would you like to say about that? 
Well, that's just always been very, very important to me. I mean, I grew up in the Appalachian Mountain region and in, uh, in a section of that where the land was ravished by coal developers and so on, who nobody really understood, nobody knew any better, and then nobody cared because they were making money. <laughs> you know, but so this is something, this, this whole thing is environmental thing has been a big thing, you know, in my writing and in my, in my life too. So, yeah. And I love that. I feel like you reflect it in the way that you so gently and generously describe the, the setting and the world around the people in addition to the characters. I really, really enjoyed those. Well, I love that. I just, I love, you know, I'm just in love with stuff like what kind of trees are here? What grows <laughs> here? What is this? What is this? You know, with, because we're losing so much of it. We're losing the natural, you know, we're losing the natural world. So I love to have the chance to like the flora and fauna of Florida there. I love, I love for them to be in that garden. And that was, that was a lot of fun for me. But also I think with this book, I was doing something a little different or trying to, because Susan, you know, the one who has Alzheimer's and goes to the home, well, she had, a, she had a, an art gallery. And so for, I think in my mind anyway, instead of having it, this book proceed into standard chapters, each one in my mind, is like a little, a little painting in Susan's <laughs> gallery. And, it has a different point of view even. So it's all, each each section here has a title, like a painting. And there's one just, it's just the garden. You know, it's a landscape painting, it's just the garden. And then there will be another and it'll be, you know, a scene in the car. But I mean, it's just like, sort of, it proceeds. I don't know, I, I see it like, I see it like a sort of a, a gallery. I love that. Yeah, that's. Yeah, that's I love really that. Really I don't know. I was writing this during COVID and everything was coming to me a little differently, I think, because of it. I don't know why. I don't know. So. I, lo I loved it. Okay, let's take a couple questions and I'm going to have my glasses on because I can't read them if I don't. Um, okay, so the first one is you have an obvious love of Southern ballads and tunes. As a fiddler, yeah. where did you see the music, listen to the ballads or attend dances? As a fiddler? Yeah. Oh, you mean the person, the person yes, that sent yes, it correct. in is a person. Yeah. I thought they thought, <laughs> thought I was a fiddler. Maybe you, did. Maybe I, you I would, have I another talent. <laughs> I would love to be a fiddler, Lord. But um, anyway, no, I grew up hearing country music and hearing music everywhere, every porch in town. I mean, everywhere, everywhere. And I never, ever got over it. And I have uh, written a whole, I'm, I myself cannot carry a tune. It's the this is the word that's probably why I wrote all these novels if I could have carried a tune I would be singing in Nashville right now and you wouldn't even know me but I'm telling you I can't and so I have to write this book and uh but music plays a huge role in everyone you know in in all of them and I have written I wrote The Devil's Dream it's about the Carter family we went to the Carter fold all the time I mean it's very close to where I grew up and Ralph Stanley was right there where we were growing up Ralph and Carter Stanley so I just grew up with all this kind of music and it has played a you know played a huge role for me awesome um, and I'm waiting to see if there are any other questions from the audience which I have to look at this little box for okay Kylie, Rebecca Hughes here. I'm curious about oh, your creative Rebecca. process. <laughs> you obviously know who this person is. Yes. Um, I'm curious about your creative Maybe process. Maybe it's not the same Rebecca Hughes. Rebecca, is this you? Is this Rebecca? She probably can't hear you. Oh, oh. Um, okay. Um, I, Rebecca Hughes is somebody who makes my website, who does my website, but she's in Virginia. Probably a different one. <laughs> Um, I'm curious about your creative. Oh, it is her. She just responded. It's me. She said, I'm curious about your creative process. Do you have any specific habit, routine, or environment that helps you get into a creative mindset? And what strategies do you implement during moments of writer's block or when you just feel stuck with your creative process? Okay. Well, I, my method is, I think, has become a uh, very very rare because I'm still I still write look what I have I mean I have nothing here but yellow pads <laughs> you know legal pads I mean I'm still writing my first draft in longhand on legal pads okay and I this is absolutely necessary for me somehow because I feel like it's a personal I think about everything so much 
I'm so ready to write it by the time I write it that it's like I'm just transmitting or something and it's just going down through my arms and it's going you know it's going onto these legal pads and it's always handwriting it's, I mean that's my first draft and I will have taken a million notes and have a lot of you know very uh little notes and stuff but when I when I do it it's always hand it's always that because it's like I'm hearing the voices from my people and um I'm just kind of transcribing, you know, I'm just writing it. I'm just writing it down. And I can hear Didi right now if I, if I, if I pick up a pen, you know, I mean, but so, and it's all physical for me. And that's how my first drafts are. And um, then I'll make many changes, you know, when I get it on the computer, of course, and I'll make many changes, but um, I'm still, I'm probably the only person in the world that's, that's still writing that way, but it's absolutely necessary for me. Is there a place, like you talked about growing up, that you really like to sit on the riverbank and read or start writing? Is there any place that, like, that's your favorite place to sit and write that you feel like the process is just easier in that particular setting than another place? Well, I'm sitting right now, now in my office, and that's just great because I've done so much stuff in here, and so I kind of, when I come in here, it's the mindset that I'm okay. I get to think about what I'm writing. You know, I don't have to think about anything else. I can shut out a lot of a lot of stuff. But I can actually do it anywhere. You know, I love motels. <laughs> you know, I love I love a motel room. Just you know, nothing to get nothing personal. You know, just I can do what's in my my head. You know, right, so right. I you know like to like to go places like that to write too. Okay, great. and eventually I could go to the computer. Um, okay, uh, here's an, a question for you. What are you reading now? Which was one of my questions that we didn't get to. So I'm glad somebody asked. Well, I'm always reading uh, the latest. I'm always reading something new. Um, oh, wait. I, I just read, for instance, some, an, another Virginia writer that I, I'm from Virginia. And another Virginia writer I like a lot is Jeanette Walls. Mm -hmm. You know, and I just read her new book which is completely different. It's like a Western set in Southwest Virginia. You know, it's got completely different. It's very entertaining. It's very, very good. So there's certain writers that the minute they publish anything out, you know, I'll grab it and read it. And so I just finished that, but I'm always, um, I have to be reading a novel or I'm just not happy. I don't know what other people are thinking about if they're not reading a novel. I have to be reading a novel, you know. Who so, would you say are your, your couple or, or, or three or maybe one favorite living Southern author? Um, Ron Rash. I love Ron Rash. Uh, yeah, Ron Rash is just astonishing. Uh, Jill McCorkle mm -hmm. is amazing. She was one of my students, actually, at Carolina when I first taught on the college level. Yeah. Uh, she's amazing. Um, Danny Wallace was also my student, and he's got a new book out right now, which is, wait, I think, where is it? Oh, wait, I'm talking to Mona, who's right here. Oh, here it is. Amazing oh, book. yes, I've heard, yes, I haven't read that, but I've heard that. This isn't going to end well. Yeah, yeah. it was, Danny wrote, Danny was one of my students, too. Danny wrote Big Fish, which was made into a film. And so on, and many other other you know other wonderful uh, works of fiction. But this is very unusual, and it's a uh, nonfiction, and it's a uh, a very brave book for him to have written about uh, somebody in his family who made a huge impression on him. And it's really unusual. It's it's an incredible book. It really is. So. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Next Just one. Now. Um, how has your creativity changed as you've gotten older or has it? Um, I think I'm much more, I mean, I, I can see that I only have so many more years to write, you know, to do. And so I'm, I'm just much more sort of judicious about what I decide to do, you know, because I, I, how much time do you have, you know? And so is this, is that project worth doing or would I rather explore such and such, you know, because I love to read so much. I love to read almost as much as I like to write. So, you know, right. it's got to be something demanding for me to do it. Okay, here's a good question since it's a, a library foundation event. Were yeah. libraries a big part of your life growing up? 
Yes, a huge part of my life growing up. Because while my parents were absolutely, you know, the most loving and wonderful parents in the world, they were not readers. I mean, either one. I mean, they had like, we had the book of, you know, the book that everybody had of a hundred famous poems, you know, that was on the coffee table, you know, and stuff like that. But they were not, I mean, they were, they, you know, they were not readers. And um, so I really, you know, so I really was, that was, that was important. I love that. Um, I'm looking to see if we have. And the, so the, well, so I should say, so let me, let me add. So, okay. so the library is where I encountered the books, you know, and we had some, even in our little, you know, our little small coal town where I was growing up, we had all the book, we had the books and we had some wonderful libraries, li librarians, Lillian Elgin who would say, read this, read this, read this. And, you know, and often gave me books that uh, would surprise you, surprise me, you know, so gone with the wind. Oh. You know. <laughs> love, yes, love libraries. Um, yeah. um, one of the things you talk about, and Talia, you'll have to tell me when we're at time, but one of the things that, we'll go back to the book a minute since I'm waiting on some other questions. Um, you talked, you, you kind of talked about this a little bit before, but obviously one of the biggest conflicts in this book is the family deciding that Herb and Susan need to go live yes. in, a, in a home. And so, you know, talk about sort of why you think it's important to talk about families and general generational issues and community even yeah. in your books. Yeah, well, I think, um, I mean, I think this is, this is a universal point <laughs> that, that families face. And, you know, at this age, I have friends right now that are making this decision all, all the time. You know, uh, I was just today, I was at a retirement community earlier today doing uh, a reading. It was a benefit for literacy, you mm -hmm. know, and so on. And um, so, but this is, you know, right. The people that were there, why were they there? Did their, you know, did their families urge them in or were they so looking forward to you know, not taking care of the big house and getting to travel and move to an easier environment, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's just, it's, you know, it's just happening. So it's a great thing to be, to be able to write about. And I think, I think that's a great blessing for all of us. I mean, who write, because you get to, you get to mull over things before you actually face them. You know, you can face things in your, uh, with your characters, and you can have your characters, my characters do things I would never do, you know, <laughs> but you can try, you can try them out with your characters. So it's a, it's been a, it's been a, just a great ride. It's been wonderful. Well, and I love that you have so many thoughts and such beautiful prose and so many important themes in this book that's not 500 pages long, which is nice, you know, yeah. um, I, 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 again, thought it was lovely. So what are you working on now? What's next? Um, I seem to be, um, I seem to be writing short stories right now. So, and I, I, one of them, actually, there's an online magazine named Narrative, and it's got, uh, which is fun to read, it's, it's got some nice fiction in it, and I have a new one right now that's just up in Narrative that they're okay. advertising it on the front, you know, so that's really nice. And um, that was something that I just, I just wrote. And so, you know, and I seem to be writing, I seem to be writing short stories right now. And every now and then I'll, uh, you know, I will go into that phase. So, so you that's, might that's do a collection or you might just could keep, you know, publishing as you write each story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And eventually maybe do a collection of them because I've got, maybe five or six of them that are not collect that have been just been published and are not collected and so on. So I may have a book before long of that, but it's, I think it's better to have stories and then put a novella with them maybe or something, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So and then I don't what know. About, this is my greatest pleasure, obviously, is writing. It's not like a job. <laughs> um, I had a job about, for a long time, but it wasn't writing. It was teaching. And I love that. I love that too. That I got to say, I like the students. Um, so do, you, do, do most of your family members read your books, like all your new books, or are they sort of like, okay, that's her job and like, you know. They don't. They don't. I mean, my immediate family does, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, my, my grandchildren, my son, my daughter, et cetera, but most, but I have a great big extended family and they don't. And, you know, I was, I was just as bad. <laughs> <laughs> 
because some of them are real churchy, you know, or real this or real that. And I just, you know, I'm just, you know, and my parents were real glad they didn't read them <laughs> because I deal with all kinds of things, you know, in my fiction. And, uh, you know, not uh, not everybody in my family is as uh, liberal or willing to talk about certain things. And, you know, so I, I mean, one thing that they used to say, well, I remember I had this uncle and he would say to people, well, I don't believe I would have said that, <laughs> you know, and so, you know, I just went to my hometown uh, recently which was wonderful because the library, they uh, they put up a sign, like a highway sign about me in front of the library on the highway. And it was really oh, nice, nice and they dedicated it. And so I went and it was really fun. But, you know, I, there's still a lot of people there that say, I wish you wouldn't write about that stuff, you know, whatever it is, and, you know, that you're going to get that. I, since you said that about going to your hometown and the sign, I think one of the things I heard you um, in an interview talk about was how your mother who had lived in that same town forever was still referred to as a foreigner. So can you she tell that story? When yeah. she died at her funeral, somebody came up after, came up after and was talking about her. And she had been a beloved home economics teacher in that town. And back in the day when home economics really meant like showing you how to, you know, how to feed your child without poisoning them, you know, I mean, how to put, put up, you know, that you should sterilize bottles and how to, you know, how to can things so that you won't poison your whole family and this kind of thing. So she was, you know, way back in the day. And, uh, but she didn't, you know, she would just assume I wasn't doing all that writing. Yeah, I can see that. Anything else you want to tell us about Silver Alert or? Well, I would just like to say, you know, about writing, I think, uh, I think it benefits us all to do some. I mean, it's, it's I'm not the only one who I'm by far who has gotten a whole lot from the process itself. I mean, it's a way I always say, I don't know what I'm thinking until I read what I wrote. And that's really true, whether it's fiction or just journaling, you know, and I think it's a, it's a wonderful uh, way for us to keep in touch with ourselves and then to go back you know, 20 years later and say, who was that? Who was that girl? You know, with that new baby, she didn't know what to do with it. Oh my God, you know, or whatever. And if you have a journal that you were keeping, if you were keeping notes, it's just a way of keeping in touch with yourself and mm -hmm. keeping, you know, keeping track of who you are and, you know, you're important, you know, and it's, it's, it's really helpful and interesting to go back and see who that was. So, a good thing to do that is that's super awesome this has been so fun um to are we it. out of time or are we going to continue going i think we're out of time and i'll i'll wrap things up but thank you selena and thank you lee both for taking time to be with us today well thank you and selena you were wonderful those were great so great were you questions. So, thank you it was my pleasure you. and thank you everybody who is watching <laughs> thanks well, I just wanted to wrap things up and, and let you know, my name is Talia White. I'm the Director of Individual Giving here at the Library Foundation. Um, we are uh, in the middle of a challenge that was given to us by Principal Foundation, who gave us a $500,000 gift, and we are trying to match that. So we would love for you to consider making a gift um, this afternoon, and I'll send you some more information about that by email. I also wanted to let you know, Jenny mentioned our Around the World events. Our next one is June 17th at University City. So we'd love for you to join us there. there we will have activities for all ages. It will be family friendly and there will be lots and lots of different things that you can join in, learn more about your library and maybe possibly visit a new branch. And our next final draft will be in person at Town Brewing on June 19th. Um, and I will be mailing your books as soon as our book plates arrive. And I'm looking forward to being in touch with you. But thank you all for joining us today. And we'll see you at the next final draft. Thank you, Lee. Thank you so much, everybody. I, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. Lee. Thank you.